Unaris, Part 1. My name is Colin Forsyth, and I am a remote viewer. Now what in the Sam hell is remote viewing, you ask? Simple. I see distant objects, places, and people without the use of technology, using only my mind. Sound like a load of crap? I promise you, it isn't. Google remote viewing right now. Really, do it. You'll see that it was a phenomenon studied by the CIA and other government agencies. Still think it's a load of crap? Sure, why not? I don't blame you. But don't tell that to the multi-billion dollar companies that hire me for my services. Now, I won't go into the details of how I got into this trade, but you should know that I learned from one of the best remote viewers alive, and I am damn good at my job. I've seen all kinds of crazy shit you can't even imagine. Well, let's just say that there is some wacky-ass stuff going on on the dark side of the moon, and it is better that you don't know about it, if you know what I mean. Just trust me on that. Someday I'll write a memoir about how I got into all this and what it takes to learn how to do it. The crazy thing is, it's not some secret X-Men power. It's just like learning any other skill or maybe a language. Everyone has the ability to learn how to do it. Some are naturally more talented than others, but that's true of everything. This skill just requires a fair amount of meditation and introspection. Can you imagine a group of adults lying around in the dark, trying to view an old missile silo in Russia with their minds? I objectively see how that could look crazy, but I digress. It's time to tell this story. I can no longer keep it to myself. Let the law be damned. I'm going to tell you about the time I found one of the most famous artifacts in history and how it has altered me to this day. Now, I take all kinds of jobs, searching for underground oil, missing persons, Al-Qaeda hideouts, etc. But my favorite kind of remote viewing is searching for lost treasure. Sunken ships, Viking hordes, mummies, you name it, I've looked for it. Something about uncovering ancient objects has always had a certain allure to me. Also, treasure hunters are the wackiest, bravest, sometimes greediest, and stupidest group of people I've ever met. In short, very entertaining. Now, this story dates back to 1999, and I was just a couple years out of the military and eager to ply my trade to anyone who could afford me. We were known in certain circles, and our skills were highly sought after. At the time, I worked for a private viewing firm loosely affiliated with the CIA. So when I was contacted directly for an under-the-table job, I was excited and ready. I would do this on my own for the first time, no one looking over my shoulder. And I'm good. I'm really good. I can say that objectively. Now, that's not to say remote viewing is flawless, and any remote viewer that says they have a 100% success rate is full of shit. An extremely talented viewer can hit around 85% of their targets, and even then, you can still be off. I would say I was in the 90th percentile in my success rate, back when I cared about percentiles and things like that. Anywho, I got the call on a gray Tuesday afternoon from a cagey-sounding guy with a southern lilt, offering me an all-expenses-paid trip to Germany. He said that, what he needed was maybe a little illegal, but that no one would be hurt and it didn't include drug trafficking. He and his associate would come to my city, I lived outside D.C., to test me, and we would go from there. I couldn't resist, and said yes almost instantly. I was pretty green back then. A week later, I found myself sitting around a hotel room table with a stocky southerner from Kentucky and another quieter man with some kind of Eastern European accent. The Kentuckian, Dan, he had called himself, was short and thin, perhaps in his mid-forties, with close-shaved brown hair, and he sported a red baseball cap with a St. Louis Cardinals logo. His rustic southern shtick was charming, but his constantly shifting brown eyes betrayed a calculated interior life. The European man, who I later found out was Greek and went by Frank, 
stood about 5'10", with mid-length jet-black hair and a perpetual scowl on his face. He wore a leather jacket and must have smoked ten packs of cigarettes a day. On first glance, one would have assumed he was an actor on the set of a bad mafioso movie, but I could hardly imagine a bunch of mafia guys hiring a remote viewer. And I could see that under his bravado, Frank was really a softy. He idly smoked in the corner of the room, blowing his smoke out the window and eyeing me suspiciously. First a test, Dan said, giving me a wry smile. Now I'm from a small town outside Louisville called Mount Washington. He pulled out a small map of the area in question and placed it on the table. Now I buried something in a field outside my town near Large Oak. Can't miss it. What'd I bury? He pointed to a blank area on the map. Not a problem, I answered. My confidence seemed to ruffle Frank, and he scowled at me but nodded his head. Go ahead, Dan said, and sat at the table expectantly. Okay, I said assuredly, but my heart rate increased, and I felt a sense of stage fright. This was my first time plying my trade without my handlers. Give me a moment. Can you lower the lights? They complied though Frank cocked an eyebrow at me as he drew the curtains. I closed my eyes and thought of a chess piece, a knight on a chessboard. This is a kind of mnemonic to instantly remind my body and mind to start remote viewing. By this point, I had done this perhaps thousands of times and spent countless hours training my mind. My body instantly relaxed and went through the motions. Now, every viewer has their own routines and visualizations unique to the individual. I use a protocol that works for me. The room melted away. I focused on my breath and imagined myself sitting in a sumptuous red chair in front of a blank movie screen. I imagined gold and red wallpaper inlaid with beautiful gold leaf flowers and vines. The more detailed, vivid, and consistent your imagination is when setting up a remote viewing session, the better. Some people ascribe spiritual connotations to our work, but trust me, while some viewers do have religious beliefs about it, most professionals see it as a clearly natural human tool inlaid in the human mind. While keeping the area of the map Dan had pointed to firmly in my mind, I conjured the image of an old-fashioned projector and watched it cast a blank white light onto an imaginary silk screen. A moment of panic. Would it work outside the confines of my safe office, equipped with all the tools of concentration and meditation I needed to execute a successful session? I used my training to calm myself, and suddenly an idyllic field filled the screen. A gorgeous, sun-filled valley surrounded by pastoral hills, with endless farmland sinking into the distance. Relief washed over me. I see it, I said aloud. It's the mark of an advanced remote viewer to be able to speak out loud and maintain focus, though I don't imagine they knew that. I see the field. There's a dirt road and an old wooden fence. I then saw the giant oak tree standing unquestionably by the side of the road, seemingly out of place in the field of grass. I see the tree. I'm moving in. I allowed myself to get up and step into my imaginary movie screen. I found myself floating near the oak's large trunk. I shifted my focus to the earth beneath the tree and peered through it, digging with my mind. There. Sitting amidst the tree's massive roots was a small pine box. I see the box. What's in it? Dan said. I could hear his excitement seeping through his voice. I gazed through the thin wood. There's... uh, Wait. uh, A single playing card. Which one? Dan said. The three of clubs, I replied, the card sharply coming into focus in my mind's eye. Son of a bitch, Dan said and whistled through his teeth. Damn, son, that's... Well, they told me it was unbelievable, but that's nothing short of a miracle. I let a slight smile touch my lips as I brought myself out of the session, 
floating back through the movie screen and slowly allowing my mind to return to my physical body. I blinked my eyes open. Both men were staring at me incredulously. You passed with flying colors, kid, Dan said. He folded up his map of Kentucky and sat back in his chair. Wait, the other man said suddenly. I'm still not convinced. Maybe lucky guess? Show him the sight. Dan looked slightly frustrated for a moment, but acquiesced. He turned back to me and sighed. <sighs> All right, kid, I'm not going to tell you why we're looking at this patch of land, but we need to know it's worth our time. His gray eyes shone in the light, and he excitedly swiped at a bead of sweat falling down his forehead. Frank stood sullenly in the back, still clearly skeptical. He opened a black briefcase and removed a map from inside. He slowly unfolded it on the table before me, carefully pressing the edges down with tobacco-yellowed fingers. It was a topographical map of a place called Nebra in Saxony-Anhalt, Germany. You uh, heard of it? Dan asked. Nope, I replied, shrugging. Could this be some kind of espionage thing, I thought? He then pointed to an area that looked to be dense forest a few miles outside of the town. Uh, tell us what's there. Uh, something interesting. We won't give you any hints, Dan said. Okay. I was still slightly nervous, but I masked it with a smile. Give me a moment. I closed my eyes and went through my routine again, step by careful step. After a few minutes, a lush forest slowly faded into view on my imaginary movie screen. I pictured myself walking into the screen I'd drawn in my mind. Suddenly, I was looking down at a beautiful, misty, old-growth forest. I could smell earth, decaying leaves. I could hear the sound of chirping birds and feel the cool moisture of live, old trees all breathing at once. I see an ancient forest. Wait, th there's, there's something. I trailed off. There was a light, a gleaming violet light calling my attention to a quadrant of the forest. I zoomed in, kind of like a visceral Google Earth, and my attention was pulled to a section of ground under some bushes. The light was coming from under the earth. I allowed the damp soil to dissipate and turn transparent. I looked below it, digging with my mind. I see... Uh, a structure, I said, surprise filling my voice. Just the foundation of, of a building, maybe the size of a basketball court buried in the earth. It's... I reached out to touch it. It felt ancient, perhaps thousands of years old. From the earth, a building began to take shape. It grew out of the damp soil, taking shape before my eyes. I spoke rapidly. I see a low squat building. It's long. It's made of some kind of stone and clay, earth and wood. The doors are inlaid with metals. Bronze, maybe? Gold? Turquoise? They're... Well, they're beautiful. I'm going inside. I see torchlight. A large hearth. A long table colorful, beautiful murals on the walls. Information was filling my brain at a rapid pace and I was struggling to keep up. Animals, warriors in blue and violet painted on them. The artistry is incredible. There's a massive chair at the end of the hall draped in animal skins. The arms are intricately carved. Wolf heads. Wait, I see... someone. I was perplexed. I'll never know what triggered what happened next. Maybe it was the power of the place, the forest. Maybe my mind was just tired enough to allow my ego to fully slip away. I still don't know. But all my sessions associated with this area were forever changed. Wait a second, I said out loud. But suddenly, I couldn't speak. I'm sure Dan and Frank were waiting for me to say something, but my mouth hung open in dumb silence. My heart started racing, and my vision suddenly focused down on a solitary figure sitting on the wolf-head chair. 
it was a man. To say I was shocked is an understatement. I had never seen a person in such vivid detail in any viewing session ever, nor had any of my colleagues to my knowledge. This kind of thing just doesn't happen. He was in his mid-fifties, maybe, and sat atop the large wooden chair with his head propped up on his fist. He gazed into space, blue eyes shining in the low light, lost in thought. He had long, curly brown hair, shocks of white ran through it, and a great beard hung down to his chest, also streaked in white. His face was rugged, and thin scars ran across his left cheek. He wore a long green cloak and animal skins. Atop his head lay a gold and bronze circlet, and about his neck was a shining pendant with a turquoise centerpiece. Clearly, he was a man of some stature and power. On his belt, a gleaming war axe sat strapped to his waist. Despite his position of repose, he looked like a coiled snake, ready to strike at any moment. His eyes suddenly flicked in my direction. Could he see me? I felt panic for a moment, and it almost brought me out of my trance, but I focused on my breath and relaxed back down, silently willing my astral body to stay in place. But no, he could not see me. He gazed through me, still lost in thought. I then felt a strong urge to approach him. I had never felt a pull like that in all my viewing sessions. This was entirely new territory. Fascinated, I floated forward, and before I knew what I was doing, I reached out to touch him with my mind's eye. I'm not sure what happened next. It's hard to explain. I was gazing at him, then I wasn't. When I opened my eyes again, I was sitting atop the large wooden chair. I looked down at my hands, gnarled, covered in rings of gold and copper. I have to open my eyes, I told myself. Come back. What? Your eyes are open, my mind responded. Wait, was that my mind? I barely had a moment to register what was happening before I felt myself slipping away, slipping away, slipping away, slipping away. Slipping away. Slipping away. Slipping away. I slide off the throne, easing my stiff, aching legs from the well-worn wood. I glance at my guards to see if they notice. They are my honor guard. I've fought, ate, drank, and lived with these men for years. They know of the aches in my joints, but they also know to pretend not to notice. Grimacing through the stiffness, I stand to my full height, pulling my cloak over my shoulders. The longhouse is deserted save for my men and a blazing hearth fire. Placing my hand on the pommel of my war axe, I stride forward and nod to a large man named Fuldoin to open the immense ornate wooden doors, and I step into the chilly air. Hefting my cloak against the cold, I walk out and look over the land that lies below the steep hill of the longhouse. Dense forest covers most of the landscape, blanketed in snow. The tree lines fall away to reveal a large wooden city, surrounded by a spiked wall. Hearth fires send curls of smoke through the thatched roofs into the gray sky, and horse-drawn carts trundle through the dirt streets. A large round structure sits in the middle of the city with a wooden spire atop it. A temple. The city bustles, but there is an unease lingering in the air. In the distance, farmland stretches into the horizon. Miles of grain fields clear cut through the thick forests. I can make out the small figures of children running through patches of snow, and a slight smile creeps onto the corners of my mouth when I think of my youngest son, 
now ten years of age, soon to be a man. But the smile slowly fades as I gaze at the sky. My father taught me that to be a ruler, you must be practical, think strategically and methodically, always two steps ahead of your opponent. That is why the city prospered, why we have banner men that pay fealty to me from hundreds of miles away, why I have grown my kingdom, Unadis, to a size my father could not possibly have dreamed. While other rulers fussed with gods and priests, taking their advisement over their own judgment, I relied purely on my instincts. When I inherited the throne, I turned my focus to the only things that truly matter in this world besides food and water, trade and metal, bronze to be exact, those shining gold-brown bars that come from the north. I tariffed traders, exported grain and other goods, stockpiled, and sometimes outright seized the metallic substance and its compounds, tin and copper. I recruited and trained the best blacksmiths the land had ever known, creating a multi-tiered guild for them, and built a stockpile so vast that no one could possibly doubt my might. Indeed, if the gods had given me anything, it is this beautiful stuff. I gazed down at my hands, ringed in gold, aching and starting to gnarl with age, and flex my fingers to fight off the cold. Of course, there are those who wish to be king and overthrow me by any means. People I used to consider friends, even. But they have no idea what it takes and the high price you must pay to be a ruler. In order to unify the hundreds of tribes and villages in our regions, I spilled blood, played neighbor against neighbor, set up strategic marriages, made peace with blood enemies, and committed horrendous deeds too terrible to name. Throughout it all, I always told myself it was for the greater good. And it was. We are stronger together. Enemies to the West, the Gauls, and sometimes their uneasy neighbors, the Iberians, raid my towns. I have been able to snuff them out time and time again with my advanced weaponry and skill in battle tactics, but they are starting to unify and outnumber us two to one. They nip at my heels like wolves in the night, melting into the forests when I try to deal them a crushing blow. Then there are the rumors of the people from the south, Traders and an increasing number of refugees fleeing north speak of a mighty kingdom, far greater than ours, that reside leagues to the south near great waters. They are bloodthirsty and ruthless, according to the stories, and their only wish is to conquer all that stand in their way. True or not, their tales panic my people, and I have reason to believe the rumors may be true. But these threats pale in comparison to the catastrophe looming quite literally over our very heads. As my thoughts bend to this threat, a chill works its way up my spine, and the pit of my stomach falls. I suddenly feel weary. The weight of the entire world pressing on my shoulders, begging me to sit down. I straighten my back and open my stance slightly, placing my hands on my hips. How much longer can I keep this up? As long as it takes, I answer and pull my shoulders back to stand taller. Father! I hear behind me, and I turn to see my youngest son, ten-year-old Odelrich, running to greet me, wooden sword in hand, and my elder son, Helferich, trailing not far behind him. We've been playing at swords, and I landed a blow upon Helferich. He beams at me, and I send a smirk at my oldest son, who returns the smile. Helferich is twelve years older than Udelrich. His mother died in childbirth, and he has her dazzling green eyes. Helferich leads my armies and proudly carries scars upon his face. Despite all of his obvious positive traits, his charisma, vigor, passion, and strength, his reliance on the gods worries me at times. 
I pray to the gods as much as any man, but I rely on them as a tool to get people what I need them to do. I use them at my leisure to inspire my people to fear and trust in me as the man chosen by the gods to lead his people. But Helferich is entranced by the gods and asks their guidance in all he does, which translates to a heavy reliance on the priests and their advice. Despite this, though, I believe he will one day be a talented leader and carry the heavy burden I bear with grace. Helferic comes to us and sweeps Odelric up in his arms, briefly spinning him in the air. My youngest son laughs and pretends to fight back. And quite a blow it was, he says, placing Odelric down, dramatically rubbing his right hip and grinning from ear to ear. The smile fades, though, and he leans in to speak softly. They're here. I nod. I knew this was coming, and I suck in the cold air through my teeth. Send them to the longhouse. I stride back through the large doors, secretly grateful for the warmth of the hearth fire, and sit upon the large wooden throne. I will give them a show of strength. I put Helferich by my right hand and call for my men to stand around me to face the door. Little Ulrich turns to leave the back room and play with his toys, but I stop him. No, stand by your brother. I nod to his nursemaid who ushers him next to me. She goes to the back room and closes the door behind her. Odelric's mother died of consumption when he was six. The priests told me her death was the price for my insolence towards the gods. I threw them out in a rage that day, telling them never to set foot in my long house again. I hear pounding on the doors, and I nod to my guards to open them. Open, open, open. open. I awoke suddenly in a room. Two men I didn't recognize gazed at me intently. Where am I? I thought to myself. Slowly my surroundings came into focus. I was in a hotel room. My name is Colin Forsyth. I looked down at my hands, hands I recognized, that I had seen every day for my entire life. I was in the middle of a remote viewing session, and, and then... Okay. I heard a voice call from the hotel room with a thick Greek accent. Enough. You did good. What? I... How long was I under? Hmm. What? What are you talking about? Dan answered. What happened? What was the last thing I said? Dan looked at me intently, a slight frown on his face. Uh, you were talking about a throne room and a chair with wolf heads, uh... Uh, that's it, he shrugged. Oh, right, yes, I responded, trying to regain my composure. Uh, of course. You okay, son? Dan asked, still frowning. Oh, yeah, it's nothing. Totally normal, I said, hoping the smile plastered on my face was convincing. Frank let out a chuckle. Show us where you see this place on the map, Frank said. I looked down and placed my finger on a quadrant of forest near a stream and a hill overlooking the town. The two men looked at each other. Okay, you pass, Frank said. You come with us. It was the clearest remote viewing session I'd ever conducted. Every color, smell, and texture was in perfect, vivid detail, as if that area of Germany called me right to it. Viewing the building in its original state, while very interesting, was not that surprising. Remote viewing does not exactly follow the laws of time and space as we know them. It's still an area we're working to perfect, and not an exact science by any means. Things can get very tricky when you view a place in the future, which has been known to happen from time to time. But what happened afterwards, when I reached out to that man and... 
Like, that was new territory to me entirely. When Frank and Dan left, I gazed into the hotel mirror and splashed water on my face, allowing my hands to trace the lines on my cheeks. What the hell was that? I had never heard of anything like that happening to anyone in my field, ever. It felt so real. My mind raced. Should I tell someone? Get advice? This was a huge breakthrough, but what if I lost myself for good? I was scared. But I was also excited, and I felt a smile well up onto my lips. No, there was no way I could give up on this. It was too interesting, too mesmerizing. And honestly, I felt drawn to it as if the visions beckoned me. But in the moment, I had completely forgotten who I, Colin, was. Despite my fear, I had to know what happened next. My curiosity about the phenomenon was piqued. Still, out of an abundance of caution, I decided not to do any viewing sessions on my own. Who knew what could happen? Normally, I would have my colleagues to bounce experiences like this off of, but freelancing was strongly frowned upon, and I wouldn't be talking to anyone anytime soon. Perhaps, I had thought, I could catalog the experience and one day bring it to someone. I said yes to the two men shortly afterwards. They were treasure hunters, and though they wouldn't tell me who was funding them, they certainly had some dough, which I desperately needed. I have a bit of a sports gambling hobby, and had just taken a big hit. Let's just say the league's worst Minnesota Twins picked the worst day imaginable to pull a garbage time upset win against the number one seeded Yankees. Unfortunately, my skills don't always necessarily translate to the, uh, shall we say predictive arts. Their prize was a Bronze Age archaeological site in Nebra, Germany where ancient Germanic tribes lived and died four to five thousand years ago. The site was closed off to the public and trespassing would be illegal. They needed to know exactly where to go in the hundreds of square miles of forest that comprised the site, which is where I came in. I was to lead them to the loot. Easy enough. Next thing I knew, I was on vacation and flying to Leipzig, Germany. The two men met me at the airport in a black sedan, and we drove a couple of hours to Saxony-Anhalt, Nebra, where we checked into a quaint little hotel. The town was charming and gothic, surrounded by rolling green fields and forests as far as the eye could see. A light rain pattered on the windshield as we pulled into the hotel parking lot in the early morning hours. They brought me to my room. At this point, the craziness and possible danger of what I was doing finally hit me, but I thought of the massive payout they promised and calmed myself. So, what am I looking for? I said, trying to sound as nonchalant as possible. Now, we're not exactly sure, but uh, even a couple swords, spearheads, or axes would make the trip worth it, maybe some jewelry, Dan said, licking his lips. Our employer really only cares about authenticity. Of course, if we found some gold coins or anything else extra special, that would be great too. Well, that's not really much to go on. I trailed off. Our employer said you are the best. Are you best? Frank interjected with a slight sneer on his face. Just... Tell us where the most goods are. The more we find, perhaps uh, you get paid more commission? I see, I answered. Are you the best? Frank repeated. The best you can get on the sly, sure, I said looking right at him. Whoever their employer was obviously knew the proper channels to hire a professional viewer but couldn't hire my firm thanks to the illegal nature of the work, so they picked a scrappy new guy with nothing much to lose. They must have done their homework. I sighed. All right, I'll see what I can do. 
Jet lag was setting in and I stifled a yawn, but I was eager to show them that a silly little thing like fatigue wouldn't stop me. I wiped my hands on my pants, now damp with sweat. I sat on the queen-size bed and closed my eyes to begin a session. Everything started normally. I relaxed down, imagined the chess piece, and put myself in the movie theater. I imagined the coordinates, the forest, and watched as it started to fade into view on the screen. I allowed myself to float back to the large structure buried under the earth. I reached out to touch the foundation, and without warning, it slowly faded backwards in time again. I watched the structure materialize into its complete form, a large hall about the size of a basketball court. I allowed my astral body to float through one of the walls. Would he be there again? A part of me hoped he wouldn't. An even bigger part of me hoped he would be there. I was surprised to find not only him sitting on the throne, but his sons and an honor guard standing around him in silence. As I wafted into the room, his eyes seemed to flick towards me. I froze, almost jumping straight out of the session at that moment, but my training kicked in, and I relaxed down into the space. It was a coincidence. His eyes moved past me and stared at the door of the great hall. I once again felt that irresistible urge pull me towards him, and I allowed myself to float forward and touch him with my mind's eye. It happened almost instantly. Colin was gone, slipping away. I gazed down at my hands, starting to gnarl, ringed in gold. gold, in gold, 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 gold. I hear pounding on the doors, and I nod to my guards to open them. Six priests and priestesses stride into the room. I gaze at them coldly. Five of them wear simple robes with hoods pulled over their heads. Colorful paint adorns their faces in intricate patterns, each indicating an affinity to a particular god. One leads Alsis by the arm. He is the head priest, blinded by his father when he was born who was head priest before him, who was blinded by his father, a tradition spanning back generations. They say it helps them listen to the words of the gods, but secretly I think it's a waste. They lead Alsis in front of my throne. Despite his age, the old man stands tall. Through the lumps of disconcerting flesh that cover his eye sockets, he seems to gaze at us a grimace covering his face. Helmsdorf, he says to me coldly. You may address me as Mina Kunik, I answer back. The gods know no kings, he says plainly. That priestly covering you have upon your head, how do you think you obtained it? I fire back. Alsis wears a large bronze helm adorned with jewels and covered in the thick brambles of an oak tree, a gift I had fashioned especially for him. And the Sky Temple, how was it finally finished? The gods? No, I did it. Have I not been more generous to the gods than any one man? I continue. The Sky Temple lay leagues to the west, a giant stone monument. Its construction has taken generations, faced setbacks, stood empty for years, but I restarted construction and completed it. The ingenious design allows for rituals to be completed precisely at the changing of the seasons, the sun peering through giant stone archways at each solstice. It is aligned perfectly with the stars above. Its original concept was far more ancient than any of us standing in this room and lost to history, but I finished it. Many man-hours and lives were lost in its construction. Need I remind you why I am here, Helmsdorf? Alsis spits back at me. 
and indeed he has me here. Spring solstice has come and gone, the sun peering through the archways at the appointed time during the celebration of Suuna. But the weather has not changed. Snow still falls from the heavens, ice covers the earth, and a thick gray haze blankets the sky, obscuring the sun behind a veil of gray clouds. Crops are failing. Our grain storage is running low. People are starving. The townsfolk are restless, looking for answers. The farmers come in droves to my doors, begging for relief where there is none to give. We are on the brink of ruin. No, I concede. You need not. You know what we need to do, but you do not act. Suna has spoken. She no longer favors this land. We must leave and find a new home, he intones to me. And leave the land of our forefathers? Displace our entire society and run away from our problems? What kind of fool do you take me for? We've had this discussion before. I know where it leads. We must go north or die, he says simply. Or you must make the ultimate sacrifice and complete the ritual. With that, Alsis nods to one of his followers who brings forward an object covered in cloth. He places it in Alsis's hands and he gingerly removes the covering to reveal a shining disc It is the most sacred object we possess. He holds it in both hands and raises it for all to see. The disc is a foot across. Its face is covered in brilliant blue turquoise to mirror the night sky, and a golden sun and crescent moon stand side by side. Stars dot the surrounding area, including the seven sisters who appear when the harvest begins. Also the planets adorn its face, those ever-fixed lights, never shimmering, always staring. The sun goddess, Suna's boat, lies below in gold leaf, ready to transport her across the sky as day turns to night. The object has been lovingly crafted by the finest artisans our kingdom has to offer and is made to precise technical specifications so that one may stand on the hill overlooking my capital city, Lubingen, and precisely track Suna's course across the sky. It has been blessed with our most holy of rituals. The device's power works as a direct connection to the gods, allowing us to calculate exactly when to harvest rotate our crops, wage war, celebrate solstice, conduct ceremonies and a myriad other functions down to the precise hour without having to travel the four-day journey to the sky temple. It used to be made of wood and human hair, sometimes bone and skin, before I had it immortalized in bronze and gold. The disc glimmers in his hands, drawing all eyes in the room to its brilliance. No amount of shiny metal can alter the god's truth. It has been forty-eight days since the spring solstice, and Suna has not blessed us with her warmth, hiding behind a veil. Our people are starving, cold, and afraid. I have given you two options, sacredly dictated by the gods. Choose one, but make a choice for the sake of all of us. For the sake of your people. Alsis pauses and wipes spittle from his thin, bloodless lips. It was only a few days before that Alsis had taken me aside on the hill overlooking Lubingen. The gods have spoken to me in a vision, he told me. An unprecedented event like this requires the ultimate sacrifice from our king. The blood of your youngest son. I laughed in his face then, but now I pause for a moment and consider, looking at my followers who gaze at me intently. I feel their eyes. I hear them internally praying to the gods for relief. 
No son of mine will pay for this, I answer, nor will we leave our ancestral lands. The gods will have to be happy with animal sacrifices and fervent prayer. I respond heavily. But Helm's Alsis begins, but I cut him off. The ritual will be completed on the new moon as requested by the gods. I say, trying to mask the weariness in my voice. We will send our best animals to the pyre. Take them all if need be. We will have the farms double the tribute. But no son of mine will die. That is my final word. Now leave. Observing my resolve, Alsis nods, recovers the disc, and wordlessly turns to leave. The priests exit in silent formation, and the heavy wooden doors shut behind them with a loud thud. Silence fills the chamber as all eyes look to me. Little Odelric's voice breaks the silence. Father, you won't let them get me, will you? Tears slide down his cheeks. Never, I answer, gripping the arms of my throne. Never, 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 never. With that, I felt myself jolt upward in a violent motion. I could feel my memory returning as I flew through the snow-covered forests, then darkness, a void. I'm Colin. I'm a... I thought for a moment. A remote viewer. I'm... Where am I? I felt myself falling at great speed. My eyes shot open just in time to find my physical body slamming into the ground next to a hotel bed. Oh shit! I cried aloud, my coccyx colliding with the floor. Instant pain racked my lower back. You okay, bud? Dan said, leaning over me and reaching a hand out. Graciously taking it, I allowed him to pull me up onto the bed. Yeah. I said, breathing hard and trying to calm my rocketing heart rate. After downing a bottle of water and counting my breaths, I shakily looked up at the two men now staring at me. What happened? Problem? Frank asked with barely masked contempt. I, I, I saw... I, I've never... The, 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 the king... I wasn't making sense. I tried to focus my mind so I could put coherent sentences together. Don't give a shit, Frank cut in. Is it here? What? I responded more out of shock than anything else. Our loot. Oh, I said, I don't know for sure, but I can take you to the site of, of the uh, a, a great hall. But listen to me, I, I have to say this at least once. You don't want to get involved with this. It feels wrong. Dangerous. Frank let out a laugh of contempt. No loot. No money. You rest now. We leave near sunset. We dig. You get your reward. Without another word, despite my protestations, the two men left the room, and I remained alone with my thoughts. Sleep came almost immediately. I was dead tired drained from my viewing session and drowsy from jet lag. As I slipped away, the events of my session played through my mind. The images of the shining disc held aloft in the ancient priest's hands dancing in my mind's eye. I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. I awoke some time later to the sound of knocking on my door. I blearily stood and opened it to find my two employers. They were dressed in black, even sporting black beanies and gloves. It was rather comical. They threw some black clothing at me. Get dressed. It's time to go, Frank said. We puzzled over the map for a few minutes, deciding our best route to the spot I pointed to. We drove in a westerly direction out of the town. 
The sun was sinking into the horizon and the forest thickened on the fringes of the small two-lane highway. I kept myself in a slightly meditative state and directed the men by feel, calling for them to turn down certain roads while double-checking the map in front of me. Turn here, I said suddenly, pointing to a dirt road heading into the forest. We turned, and I felt a strange familiarity wash over me as we made our way through the thick forest. This was correct. We were headed in the right direction. The sun was mostly gone now, and Frank turned on the high beams. We drove until we reached a chain wooden gate. A sign hung over it, and I could make out the word Achtung, and words that I imagine said no trespassing, or something to that effect under it in German. Through here. Frank nodded and got out of the car. He opened the trunk and produced some bolt cutters. He broke the chain and swung the gate open. We drove for five more minutes before I said, Here, here, pull over here. Frank complied, and we stepped out of the black sedan. I watched him cover the back of the car with brush, masking it from view. Off of my look, he gave me a, you never can be too careful kind of shrug. The forest looked, sounded, and smelled exactly as I had remembered it in my sessions, and I closed my eyes to soak it in. Frank and Dan rummaged through the trunk of the sedan and pulled out two metal detectors and a couple of mattocks and shovels. That is your gear? I scoffed at them. What do you expect? Frank said, lighting a cigarette and hoisting the detector over his shoulders. The two men looked comical with their metal detectors that could have belonged to any dude on a beach. I'm not sure what I had expected. Maybe some kind of underground seismic sensor or something of that sort. Still, their lack of fancy gear unnerved me. Carry this, son. Dan threw me a backpack and I hoisted it on my shoulders. It was lighter than I expected. The sun was long gone by now and the sounds of the forest at night began to permeate our ears. So, flashlights? I said. Nope, Dan said with a grin. We're going to let our eyes adjust to the dark. Best way to do a night hike. Also, full moon tonight. I looked up to find the moon beginning its ascent across the sky. How could I not have noticed something so obvious? It'll practically be daylight soon, Dan continued. I shrugged and nodded. I had spent some time in the forest at night in basic training, long before I knew my military career would land me in this crazy line of work. I had been honorably discharged from the service officially, but in truth I had been recruited and accepted into the CIA's special remote viewing program. The program had eventually dissolved, and we were swallowed into a private military contractor that specialized in so-called psychic phenomena, but I digress. Okay, magic boy, Dan said, hoisting his gear onto his back. Where to? We trudged for some time, carefully stepping over roots and bushes. The farther we hiked, the more familiar our surroundings became to my senses. I had never been to a place I had viewed before, with the exception of some training sites when I was younger. But this was a surreal experience, to say the least. Every step I took made me feel more at home, more at peace. It felt like I was visiting an old friend. The moon rose over the horizon, and soon the forest was bathed in her soft glow. We trudged wordlessly, allowing me to soak in the immense beauty of the myriad of trees, accompanied by only our footfalls and the soft patter of the day's rain still falling from the leaves. After fifteen minutes or so, we came upon an open space in the wood. Through the crisscross of branches, it looked to be about a hundred yards in size. Suddenly, a light flickered to life in the clearing. It seemed to be the light of a large, orange bonfire. I froze and instinctively crouched. What is it? Dan asked. Did, did you see that? I whispered. The two men were crouching next to me. No, I didn't see nothing. What are you talking about? Dan whispered back. 
The light grew larger and seemed to dance and flicker. You don't see that? I said, panic filling my voice. Why, I I don't see anything, Frank said. What is going on with you? I looked out. There was a lone fire, unmistakably blazing ahead of us in the center of the clearing. You are telling me you don't see a fire in the middle of that field right there? I said, pointing. I blinked my eyes a couple of times. You're beginning to scare me, man, Dan said and put a hand on my shoulder. Uh, Are you all right? I nodded my head, but I was not all right. The blaze in the middle of the field grew in size. I began to feel its heat, see its orange glow create shadows on the tree branches. My eyes are open. I'm not doing a viewing, not in a meditation. I see a big ass fire right there in plain sight, and you guys are telling me you don't see a damn thing. Something isn't right. No part of me understands what is going on right now. I turned to Frank and noticed his lips moving, but I was unable to hear any words. I faltered and placed my hands on my temples, suddenly aware of a throbbing pain in my head. I could feel something shifting inside me, like I was slipping away, losing myself. The same thing I felt when I reached out to touch King Helmsdorf in my sessions. Helmsdorf? Yes, that's me. I felt myself stand and begin to walk to the fire. Its glow warmed my chilled limbs. Frank and Dan dumbly followed me. Frank and Dan. No. Fuldoin and my honor guard in full battle dress. Battle, 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 battle.